Made for Women by Women, Royale was co-founded by Yang Hee Paik, who is on a mission to provide clean, sustainable, and thoughtfully designed holistic personal care products for women, empowering women with better products. And this is a story you don't want to miss. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Founded Beauty, a podcast dedicated to beauty entrepreneurs who built some of the biggest brands today and where we learn exactly how they did it. We'll cover some of the most intimate stories, their path to success, and how they overcame the obstacles along the way. I'm Akash Mehta, CEO and co-founder of Fable and Main, a modern hair wellness brand inspired by ancient Indian beauty secrets. Building Fable and Main has been an incredible journey so far, and I've decided to launch this podcast as a founder, keen to learn and connect with fellow beauty brand founders around the world. I believe in collaboration over competition, and so I'm using this platform as a way to inspire and hopefully help each other in what can be quite a tough and lonely journey. So if you are an entrepreneur or simply just curious how to build a brand, this podcast is perfect for you. So without further ado, it's a delight to introduce your guest for today, Yang Hee Paik. Founded by three Korean-American women in LA, Rael empowers women to make healthier choices for their skin and their bodies. Today, I'm sitting down with the co-founder, Yang Hee, to discuss Rael's holistic approach to self-care for women. Rael now ranges from organic natural period care to skincare and personal hygiene products, quickly becoming the go-to product and brand for women. From a movie distributor at the Walt Disney Studios and with a Harvard MBA to now CEO and co-founder of Rael, Yang Hee has an incredibly dynamic and determined spirit that I personally aspire to be and I just want to say, Yangi, thank you so much for being here because it's an absolute honor. Thank you. Thank you, Akash, for having me. Um, I'm actually really loving what you do, your company, and also the podcast. So thank you so much for inviting me to be part of it. No, it's it's absolutely my pleasure. And I, you know, as you know, as um, you've been listening to the podcast, I asked this question, so I'm sure you've been prepared. But in a <laughs> nutshell, who is Yangi? So I am the CEO co-founder of Rael. Um, I am a first-generation immigrant in the U.S., originally from Korea. I moved around quite a bit growing up. I was born in Korea. I lived in Paris when I was little. I lived in New Jersey when I was in high school, moved back to Korea, and then it was my dream to come back to the U.S. to go to business school. So I moved out here by myself. I left my home and family behind um, to go to business school 15 years ago. Uh, After MBA, you know, to be very honest, back then, my passion was in entertainment business. So I moved to LA. I joined the Boston Consulting Group to focus on media consulting. And after two years, I joined the strategy team at the Walt Disney Studios. I was a studio executive for about eight years. And uh, my life completely changed when when I met my co-founders who inspired me to do uh, Rial together with them. I mean, I mean, let's just pause for a second. You say that very, very uh, humbly, but you've got a Harvard Business School MBA. You've worked at BCG. You've had an incredible career at Walt Disney. I mean, this is a feat that people aspire and you've done it at such an early stage. I would just love to know, how did you, well, not exactly how did you get all those opportunities, but how did you like get inspired to go down this route? Because it's not easy to do that and you've done mm-hmm. it. So um, I happen to be actually an accidental entrepreneur. So to be honest, I was not thinking of getting into beauty or getting into a startup company, you know, when I came to the U.S. while I was studying at uh, business school. So when I wrote my application from MBA school, I actually talked about Hollywood, entertainment, getting into Disney. So that was my passion back then. So I had this dream, you know, coming from Korea that after Harvard MBA, maybe I'll have a chance to work in Hollywood and work in one of the major studios over there. So I had that vision and dream, but that was not easy because I didn't come from entertainment business. And even at Harvard, you know, when I was interviewing with a lot of entertainment companies, they were looking for somebody with the relevant background. And I had a consulting background from Korea, which had nothing to do with the entertainment business or Hollywood in the US. So after interviewing around a little bit, I decided that I would get into uh, BCG first and then learn the, you know, the skills that I needed to get into um, one of the Hollywood movie studios. And then, uh, you know, interview around and then get the job. So it was kind of like a two-step approach for me to get there. Um, And at at BCG, I was lucky because I particularly wanted to be in the LA office to be exposed to the media and tech media industry. So that was the right choice. So after I came to LA, 
I was put on some media content related strategy consulting project. So I gained a lot of experience and got networked through it. And then when there was an opening at the Walt Disney Studios on the strategy team, I interviewed and they were particularly looking for somebody with MBA and then consulting background. So my experience finally really fit in what they were looking for. So then I got the job, uh, joined Disney, and then I moved around within the organization quite a bit. So um, most of my time was spent on digital movie distribution, meaning I was working with Apple, Google, Amazon type of companies to sell Disney movies, you know, through digital platforms. So that was my previous life, which is very different from what I'm currently doing at Rael. I mean, I mean, yes, but I mean, it's also, I think, super important to kind of take all the learnings and the growth that you did in these companies. And I'm sure you've extrapolated a lot of that into where you are today as a CEO. Um, but I do have to ask before we move on, are you team Disney, team Pixar, team Marvel or team Star Wars? Uh, oh, I used to sell everything, but I would say I uh, Disney animation, you know, that's yeah. where my dream for Disney kind of, you know, started, you know, watching Little Mermaid and all these Disney animations yeah. growing up. So I love Disney like music and then OST and then all of that animations. Oh, amazing. I mean, yeah, that that's, I mean, that's super exciting. But I, you know, <laughs> then, you, as you said, um, from there, you, it was an, a, a beautiful but accidental kind of step into entrepreneurship where you met your co-founders today. And I would love to know how you met them and how that journey began. Yeah, so we were not friends or we were not co-workers at all. And then um, I didn't know them at all before I started Rael. So it is also another story, kind of like really uh, sudden, kind of like a very random kind of, you know, story as well. So what happened was, you know, I worked at Disney for almost eight years. Um, I thought I had my dream job, you know, like you joined the company thinking that I'm going to retire from Disney. This is my dream job. But after doing a pretty similar job for about eight years that you start to wonder what your next steps would be. And then um, I actually had a huge passion for K-pop Korean content. I don't know if I actually you follow like BTS or any I, of those. Of course. I mean, I'm actually very good <laughs> friends with uh, Sunmi and uh, Blackpink. I, 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 when I worked at Dio, I went to Korea all the time. So oh. I went to Seoul. So yeah, yeah we can talk about yeah. that offline. There's a whole thing we can we can keep up. Uh, be yeah, talk about that for a long time. Yeah, I love it. yeah. So while I love to be in Hollywood and you know work at one of the movie, like biggest movie studios, my other passion was you know Korean content, you know K-pop and all of that. But then I was watching what was happening, and you know Sai kind of happened on its own. BTS was yeah. emerging and. What happened to BTS was kind of what I envisioned that I could contribute and do after gaining my experience in the U.S. But it kind of happened because of the talent and then the creative, you know, the artist. So I felt like I lost my purpose. I didn't know what I was going to do with, you know, all the experience and skill sets that I got from Hollywood. So I was kind of like, you know, soul searching around that time. OK, what I should do, what I should, you know, really do to make impact on this world. And um Disney is a, an amazing company, but it's such a big, big company that I always felt like I was like a little piece in a big machine. And even if I didn't exist there, things would just work fine and smoothly, right? And um, because I was in the movie industry, what really mattered the most was the content. You know, if the content was good, if the movie was well made, then it would just sell. And I was the, on the sales side of things, and I felt like my contribution or impact was not meaningful enough and big enough. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be in a position where I could actually make impact on people's lives directly and also be in a more decision-making position because, you know, there were so many layers at Disney, you know, because it's a big company. And around that time, um, I actually did an interview with a Korean newspaper who wanted to talk about my journey from Korea to the U.S. and then consulting in Disney. So I met the journalist and talked about my kind of passion for all this, like how I got there. It wasn't that easy to actually even get the job in Hollywood because um, I didn't have a visa, proper visa. So as an international person, I don't know if wow. you can relate to it at cash, but yeah. I had to get the visa sponsored so you know i had a lot of disadvantages you know coming from korea but yeah. i overcame that and then kind of like went up the ladder in the corporate world so i talked about that um on the interview and uh, one of my uh, co-founders her name is anes she's actually a famous writer in korea she lives here in, in oc in the orange county area but she writes in korean she was a best-selling author in her 20s, writing about woman empowerment, female leadership stories. So she interviews a lot of female leaders that like to talk about you know, how women pursue their dream and then succeed it and things like that. 
And uh, she's one of the very few people who read the newspaper interviews, basically. So she read it, she read about me, and then she reached out to me. And she introduced herself as a writer who writes about women's stories. So that was very intriguing. And then she said she wanted to meet me, you know, get to know me. So I was like, oh, why not? We live close by in LA. Um, so I met her one night and we had a very nice dinner together. And I didn't realize that was like a job interview. We just like met up and then just chatted about life and what we like doing. And we really bonded and we hit it off. And then at the end of the conversation, she goes, Yanghee, I'm thinking about this startup idea. You know, I've been following all the woman issues and she had recently become a mom of twins. So she's been looking for organic natural you know, products more for women and really found that in the feminine care industry, you know, there's no really great option, you know, that are organic natural and also that work really well. Um, and uh, as I thought about it, I was like, oh, I thought all these products were made with natural ingredients and safe ingredients and never really thought about what my pads and tampons were made of. So it was really uh, enlightening to hear from her that actually the products we have been using uh, contain a lot of plastic ingredients, which touch the most intimate part of women's bodies, you know, are made with plastic and nobody really knew or cared about that until now for so many years. So that was really an inspiring story to hear. And another angle was actually um, a lot of women like us who move from Korea to the U.S., um, when we go back to Korea, we buy a lot of Korean pads and bring them to the U.S. So it's kind of like K-beauty, like, you know, Korean feminine yeah. care are high performing, very comfortable, really high quality. Uh, you cannot really find that kind of high quality feminine care products in the U.S. So we had this idea that, yeah, I mean, the organic natural feminine care should be an emerging trend now in the feminine care space. People should be looking for them. And if we made these products in Korea using the novel technology, from there, then people don't have to sacrifice performance or, or efficacy while they choose a healthy option for feminine care. And uh, I don't know, Akash, if you can relate to it, but for women, feminine care products have to work, even though it can be made with like the most organic ingredients if it leaks doesn't really performance do its job. is crucial yeah, yeah yeah people will just abandon it and then just go back to the conventional product so what we really focused on was the performance while using the organic natural ingredients so that was the idea that we had and of course you know even though the conversation was very interesting with Anes that night I was like, yeah, well, thank you, but no, thank you. I'm, I'm happy at Disney. <laughs> Never thought about getting into a feminine care startup company. Like, you know, I didn't have the CPG background. Uh, I didn't yeah. feel like I could really help them out. You know, they thought because they come from more creative backgrounds. So my one co-founder is a writer. The other co-founder comes from a graphic design background. So mm -hmm. they were looking for somebody like me who had more like corporate America experience, you know, uh, who can help them scale the business. But I felt like I was not ready for it because I didn't think of getting into this space or I did not come from the right, you know, um, you know, industry. So I told them that like, no, thank you. This is really interesting, but you know, I don't think I'm ready for this. And uh, it took like uh, three, four months actually for me to make a decision and jump into this. So what I did was um, I spent a lot of time with my co-founders because um, you know we didn't go to school together or we never worked together. So I needed to make sure that we get along and we have the right yes. vision and that we were looking for the same aim you know, as co-founders. So I spent a lot of time with them talking about what each person can bring to the table, how we'll work together as a team, and then talking about the vision of the company. Um, I mean, the one thing common that we had was we wanted to really build a mission-driven company, really helping other women you know, with the kind of technology that we knew from Korea, leveraging our cultural background, and really want to uh, build something or create products that we as consumers, as women want to use. So we had this common goal to do that. So three, four months later, um, I left to Disney and people thought I was a little crazy uh, yeah. to leave entertainment, to get into uh, feminine care, startup world, uh, which I didn't know anything about, but um, it was a really fun journey. You know, since then it's been about four years and I'm glad that I took the risk and the the, the offer from Anes to really get into it. Oh, well, I'm sure they're equally as glad that you, you jumped on board because I think together as a trio, it is what it is today. And, and you know, speaking of that, I would love just to kind of, you went from, you left the job, which I do want to ask, because a lot of people are, you know, either thinking of or they would like to, they're not happy in their corporate life, but they don't, they're scared of the, the unknown of entrepreneurship or founding a brand or founding a company. Um, 
was it like did you have to like psych yourself up and say today i'm quitting or you know was it or did you just feel comfortable like what was that process like Oh, uh, it was a pretty lengthy process. And, you know, I come from management consulting background. So yeah. the first thing I did was interviewing a lot of experts, basically, who knew about the industry or who knew about this kind of startup world. So, you know, um, it was interesting because uh, even though I told Anes that I was not interested at the beginning, I just couldn't stop thinking about this. You know, you're, you're like, still interested. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Because like, I was telling her, oh, no, thank you. I'm OK at Disney. I'm not going to really pursue this. But then like. At night, I was talking to my friends to talk about this and like getting their, you know, advice. So I just couldn't really stop thinking about it. And I think I had something in my heart to was like, which was really following this, um, you know, vision. But, you know, I started with my um, like private equity friends um, and then people who used to work at PNG of the world, uh, really mm-hmm. understanding the industry, the opportunity, because, um, you know, four years ago, it was obvious that you know, the industry was dominated by the big brands, you know, P&G, Kimberly yeah. Clark of the world. And there were a yes. couple of, you know, startup companies emerging, but nobody was able to really get into the mainstream, you know, with the organic natural feminine care. So there is definitely an opportunity to disrupt the market, which is, you know, a massive industry because everybody menstruates. It's like 40 years of their lives every month. Yeah. So it is a very, very, you know, sizable market. And then while I was talking to my friends who went to business school and who went through a similar journey, they were telling me actually, Yang He, you've been in a corporate world for what, 15 years, like 13, 15 years. And, uh, you have nothing to lose. I mean, I think I'm a risk averse person. So I think um, I might not have taken this if it was like three years after college, you know, because I, yeah. I felt like I was insecure in my kind of career journey or path or experience. I might not have really jumped into this. But yeah. one of a good friend, um, one of my best friends, uh, she told me that, well, you have this 15 years experience, like half consulting, half movie studio distribution. And even if you fail in the next five years, like you how much back. difference yeah, would that make? I may not make as much money as I could have when I stayed in a stable job, but from a career kind of experience, you know, perspective, like people actually appreciate startup experience, even if it doesn't really happen, even if you fail, you know, the experience you gain from that failure is also very meaningful. So I was thinking about my 15 year of like corporate experience. And then if I did this, and even if it failed, I would have learned a lot. I would have gained the leadership experience. I may not have enough money, but still like I could get another job after this. So that was my thought process, you know, um, even if this, this was a risk, I thought what I could gain as an experience would be bigger than, you know, the kind of the sacrifice I had to make. And I think it's also because a lot of people are risk adverse people. And I think it's great to see how your mindset actually kind of challenge those inner thoughts of like, yes, but no, but yes. And there is always ways to convince yourself and, you know, to actually um, change your mindset in a way. But I think it is important to have done the processes and the due diligence of checking with friends and understanding because it is also a risk. I mean, there is a risk of finding your brand. You know, there's a reason why they say a lot of brands don't succeed. And, you know, it's a risk of uh, not having that stable income to have something that you might not see money in your pocket till a, a year, even after you, you create the brand, you know, or even longer. So it is, a, it is definitely a, um, something that takes some time, but I'm really glad you went and you did it. And I would love to know... Um, uh, what was that kind of initial thought crisis of say, okay, you all three came together, you're all in now, you're all working full time on this. Um, did you put some kind of uh, friends and family fundraising? Did you have your own money or did you go straight to kind of raising just to start the company initially? Yeah, so Anes, who approached me, you know, the writer, co-founder, she put her like family money into this, you know, so she had kind of like the platform, you know, for us to, uh, started, Kickstart. which was good. Yeah, yeah kick started. So that was good. But then we actually went to investors pretty early on. We knew that uh, feminine care industry uh, business takes up a lot of capital because the MOQs is pretty big. You know, it's a little different yeah. from beauty. You have to buy, make a lot of products and have to really um, convince the factories that you will be a legitimate player in this market. And a long term um, player. Yeah. 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 So we needed a lot of capital to kickstart this business. So we had the pre series A fundraising round and series A round, and we're just about to finish series B. So the investor, you know, has always been a big part of, you know, how we grew the company. 
But this is so well. We'll get to series B soon because that's super exciting. Because mm-hmm. obviously shows are doing something right. Um, <laughs> but I do, you know, especially with the series A. Um, initially, you know, it's all not even that. Even with the labs and the production, um, what often offsets some of their worries, especially with MOQ, is having retail support. And I know now you guys are in phenomenal retailers with Target, Walmart, uh, CVS, and and more. Um, did you have that lined up from the beginning, or did it take time to cultivate those relationships? Oh, it took time, definitely. Um, but we were pretty unique in a way that we started our business on Amazon. I know there are not that many companies who start on Amazon. You know, everybody starts from like D2C and then retail and then Amazon. But we had a very different approach because uh, initially, you know, we didn't have a big team. We didn't have a big marketing team or budget at all. And then what we actually really wanted to do was to prove our concept and gain a lot of customer reviews through Amazon. So yeah. right after we made our organic cotton pads and liners, we launched them on Amazon. This is back in 2017. And, you know, it was not as competitive back then. So there were a few competitors on Amazon. And then they did not really have that great reviews because everybody was complaining about the leaks and then lack of performance. And once we launched Quality. our product, yeah, once we launched our product, we just organically gained so many five-star reviews. And within three, four months, we became number one organic pad and liner on Amazon. I read. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah, so that was a big accomplishment, and that actually gave us a lot of confidence to go to investors to raise money because, you know, the concept was proven, the quality was there, and then anyone could go to Amazon and read our reviews, uh, which were all organically, you know, collected and done. And what we also did was, you know, we constantly, we analyzed every single review on Amazon and then learned about our improvement opportunities. So we went back to the factory, you know, with additional kind of comments, like feedback every time we went. And the version that we have currently is actually our number seventh, seventh edition, Amazing. you know, so that's how many times we went back to the factory to address any kind of improvement opportunities after reading the, the review. So Amazon is still a big part of our um, our, our business. And actually, just to brag about it a little bit, now uh, within the pad category, you know, including Always of the World, we're actually number one brand uh, on Amazon. Oh, wow. in the pad Congratulations. Category. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah and, I'm not surprised. I mean, you guys have credit products, but yeah, amazing. Yeah. So, you know, some people think that Amazon is not cool, you know, like D2C is kind of like the star. But for us, we want it to be approachable, accessible. Um, we want it to be where people are already there, to, ready to shop, because it's a lot. It takes yeah. a lot to bring people over to a new website. So we want it to be 100%. where people were looking for the products for them, and that we were very confident about our quality. So we just like let it be there, gain a lot of reviews. So that's still a big part of our business. But we knew that we wanted to be an omni-channel brand because, like yeah. I said, accessibility is a big part of you know our values, and uh, we just wanted to be where women were already shopping feminine care products and then personal care products. So shortly after we raised you know pre-series A, we launched our D2C site getrial.com, and then started working on our retail distribution uh, and strategy. And then we knew that we wanted to start with Target, so we reached out to the, reached out to them had a great meeting with them and got into Target back in 2019. And that was the beginning of our brick and mortar expansion. And uh, this year is such a monumental year for us because we got into CVS, Walgreens, Walmart. Uh, We've been in Urban Outfitters and Thropology already working with like Nordstrom. So all the big players in the market and love being everywhere, you know, uh, women are shopping. Uh, it's an, I think, again, you keep on going back to this, which I love, which is where women are shopping. And it's you're putting the consumer first and you're making it accessible. And I completely agree. I mean, for me, I would, I'm would i an Amazon fanatic. I would love to sell my brand on Amazon. It's just, as you know, with certain retailers, there's certain no-nos you don't go for the beginning. So, you know, we, mm-hmm. we, 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 we do listen but to that. But I, I will one day definitely put my products on Amazon. I think it's I think it's definitely the future of, of, of retail and buying. And it's where everyone is kind of chopping the whole holistic, you know, whatever they need. And what I wanted to ask at the beginning, but I think you've answered that when I read about it was, you know, to get to a number one brand on Amazon first as a single product, then as a brand in itself within a category, normally there is some hacks, right? There is initially, there is the whole, like, do you do kind of seeding and, and ads and et cetera, but you said it's organic and that's pretty incredible because that's a, the best proof of concept you could ever ask for, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And, and I think that's just really phenomenal. So would you really recommend people who are starting a business that, you know, we often get sidetracked with retail or um, even investors saying, look, you can't just have one product. You have to have many more to start with. Um, would you recommend sometimes having a one skew initial launch and, and doing a proof of concept could be a really great way to start? Um, I think so. And maybe like a couple, like a trio, I think could work, but you know, not like 10 products together, you know, at once, yeah. um, you know, we launched with our organic pads first and then added liners shortly after that and has been, has been growing the portfolio, but initially it was definitely the pads, but pads had a few different SKUs because, you know, there's like regular pads, overnight pads, different sizes. So if, if you, if you count the SKUs, it was actually like four different SKUs that we launched with, but it was great to really prove the concept with that one kind of hero SKU. And then with that success, we were able to really leverage our learnings from it to all the other products that we developed. Amazing. And I, you know, I actually do want to ask, cause it's very, it's always top of mind when I, hear about brands and, and see the names is how did the name Rael get to be? Can you guess? <laughs> uh, hmm. I, you know, the worst, the, the thing is I, I do so much research into the founder and then the brand as well. And then like, I just, I feel like I would have read about it. I haven't read about it. So I'm not going to yeah. lie. I have no yeah. idea, but I, yeah. I, I, I can imagine. No, no, let me guess. It's real with a spin of A and E. No. You are correct. Yeah, no, Am you're correct? smart. You're correct. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, that's Amazing. definitely it. Yeah, so, you know, it's um, real. We drive real results. And then it's yes. real organic, real healthy. We love the word real. But real is a very diff difficult word to trademark. You can't trademark it. <laughs> no, <laughs> And no, I, I thank you for saying trademark because I, I always say that. Like people, like it's, it's expensive. It's also nearly impossible, especially in class three. Everything's been taken and you can't do things. So you have to think of something, a unique name sometimes. I know. So we love the word real, but we couldn't get it. So we thought about different ways of still making it look like real or has some sort of connection to real. And uh, we just flipped ENA and uh, it sounded uh, very elegant and then something very unique. I mean, there's nothing like that out there and it's pretty short. It's, it's easy to remember. And some people may just like Google real if they don't realize what it is and the real will show up. So uh, it was a little strategy that we had to confuse people. I love it. Beautiful name, beautiful logo and um, your packaging as well. And actually on packaging, I love always asking this question. It's like, um, I know you had, you said, um, you're one of your, the, the uh, other co-founder, um, please remind me of her name. The one with the graphic design experience. Uh, Pina. Kim, yep. Um, Pina, yeah. does she have a big pivotal role in the beautiful packaging and design? Yeah, I mean, initially she was the one doing all the design herself. So she was the executor, you know, the strategy behind it. But now we have a big creative team. We still do everything sure. in-house. Yeah, so she's not really the one doing that. But Pin actually became or she moved to the CPO um, role. So she's our chief product officer. And uh, one thing that we're proud of is actually we built our own R&D team, product development team in Korea on the ground. So we started in LA together, the three of us. Us, but Pina's life or like her work hours were all in the Korean hours because like at night she was talking to the factories, you know, looking at samples together with the factories and all of that. So we thought it made sense for her to move to Korea to open up our Korea office. So she did yep. that three years ago. She moved out there um, by herself and then opened our Korea office, one person team. And now we actually have over like 20 people in Korea. And then she has her own product developers. Um, who whose job is really fun, you know, kind of always sourcing, identifying the new trends, you know, um, emerging uh, products in Korea, and then working with the K beauty manufacturers and our feminine care manufacturers to discuss all the uh, new ideas, you know, novel, um, more sustainable ingredients, and it really helps that we are on the ground because. Um, we also do direct -to business in Korea. So we're a top organic uh, personal care brand in Korea. So all these manufacturers know us um, because I think there's a difference between uh, some brands who are in the U.S., who are K-beauty brands, but who have no presence in Korea. So the Korean people or the Korean manufacturers don't really know them. But we're yeah. a little different from that, that we have a big presence in Korea, too. So now all these manufacturers actually come to us with their own ideas, like pitching new ideas to us. So it's fun to partner with them, you know, who have passion to get into the U.S. market so we can constantly work together, collaborate with the you know, manufacturing partners to come up with better ideas. I think it's so important. And, you know, 
the, the power of the Korean market is also, it, it will be, there's two angles. One is you're taking a lot of inspiration from there. So I think it's important to also have your product selling there and, you know, and, and supporting women there as well. But at the same time, um, I think there's a lot of business opportunity in Korea. It's one market that I'm really trying to also work towards bringing my brand there. Um, do you have like a separate strategy, which is, I mean, when I worked at Dior, you know, I was working with Kakao Talk and KOLs and as you said, <laughs> the, the K-pop stars, it's a whole different game there. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but it's incredible. Do you have like a whole new strategy that's a little bit um, Korean centric or do you find that actually it marries very closely to your US kind of strategy? Uh, I mean, there's definitely something very unique about the Korean market. So the um, overall, um, you know, kind of mission, you know, philosophy of the brand is exactly the same. We're a big woman empowerment brand. And in Korea, there are not too many brands started mm. by women for women. So they love the fact that it was started by especially like Korean American women who wanted to do something in the U.S. market, who brought the product to the, the Korean market. So we get a lot of credit for that. But uh, what's really funny, or, or what's really interesting in Korea is like the live streaming. Um, yes, I'm sure you've huge. seen it. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's huge. So, you know, like we work with a lot of influencers in the U.S., but it's more um, PR, you know, like awareness campaigns. Yeah. You don't really expect, you know, like sales Results to be Results in driven. business. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But a lot of influencers we worked in Korea, you know, they give out codes or they actually sell products, you know, for us. And there's a huge volume actually created by these influencers. So we're always amazed by those like live streaming um, opportunities in Korean market and also China. I see that happening a lot in, in a those lot markets. With mini, we yeah. chat and mini programs. And yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That. So that's something that I'm kind of like keeping an eye on because I think mm -hmm. it's going to happen in the U.S. market as well, but hasn't yet happened yeah. yet. Yeah, but I'm sure like that trend from Asia is somehow will arrive here. It ends up soon. always coming. Just there's always this buffer period or some years of de delay, but it will it will come. And I think um, it's so important for anyone who has the luxury to to kind of listen and even to even as simple as just getting subscriptions to um, Korean beauty or um, you know even J beauty or any kind of anything in Asia, if you can get some learnings, you'll learn so much that you can extrapolate some ideas and bring it to your market. It's so important because I learned the most when I was in those markets at Dior and I, I tried to take some of them into the European market and into USA. Mm -hmm. uh, not always successful because the consumer is very different, as you know, but still it's important to try. Yeah, so yeah. And uh, another kind of interesting trend that has happened in Korea is that organic feminine care market has become truly mainstream. So I would say 30, 40 percent of feminine care has shifted to organic natural because of some kind of like scandal that happened uh, three mm. years ago in Korea. So that's something that I'm hoping to also see in the U.S. market. There has to be some kind of like catalyst to educate people about, you know, the conventional products, not having the most healthy, safest ingredients. And then there are some alternatives, you know, started by startup companies, you know, with more natural organic ingredients. So that's also another big trend that I'm waiting in the US, you know, uh, to happen. Definitely. And I would also want to kind of touch upon your incredible work you guys do in giving back and raising awareness. Um, I know on your website, you have this um, kind of section where it's called Rail, Rail Gives Back. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk us a bit about that and about, um, you know, the, the initiatives you support, like I support the girls and hashtag happy period. Yeah, so Happy Period is an organic nonprofit organization based in LA. And uh, once we heard about the founder story, it was really inspiring. I think we started working with them about three years ago. Um, and it was a local organization focused on the homeless, um, you know, um, woman in downtown LA where we are located. So basically what they do is they give out uh, personal care kits to the homeless woman and also um, give out these products to homeless shelters. So we wanted to do something to help them out by donating products and also participating in the packing event. Um, so now we cannot do it anymore because of COVID, but before COVID started, we participated in some of the events, um, packed the products together, went over to Skid Row, which is a big homeless kind of neighborhood in downtown LA, and they really saw um, how much people struggle, you know, with like mental illness and then drug problems, you know, and then it was shocking to me because I'm sitting here in our downtown LA office, which is uh, five minutes away from Skid Row, actually. And there's a clear division, like this is a nice neighborhood, but if I drive like five minutes away from here, there's a 
homeless neighborhood starting. People are just like on the street, you know, um, it's really sad to see it. Um, so we wanted to do our part, you know, to help a woman who don't have access to peer products. And some people would just like bleed through their, you know, pens because they don't have access to uh, pads and tampons. Um, yeah. So, you know, for them to keep the very, you know, minimum dignity, you know, uh, we wanted to give out our products to them. So we um, donate our products, participate in the packing event. And even with like, I support the girls, we've donated products to them. They actually looked at, um, they worked with um, some uh, victims of domestic violence during pan the pandemic. Um, we didn't know this until we spoke to them, but during the pandemic, some women actually um, were victims of domestic violence. And then some men would actually hide their feminine care products so they cannot get out of houses, you know? So we wanted to provide the feminine care essentials to those victims as well. So have been partnering with a number of nonprofit organizations for period poverty, to fight period poverty, and also, you know, for period dignity and anything that we can do with what we do and with our products, we want to do more of. Well, thank you. And, and, I, and I think it's so important and uh, especially... I love this um, when you say menstrual dignity um, for all women. I think it's super and powerful because, and that's what you're doing. And I, I love how it's also quite grassroots. It's you know, it's whatever is. Um, it's not about necessarily uh, fixing the whole world's problem overnight, but starting root by root, area by area. I think it's super important, and spreading the awareness of it is is pivotal. So thank you for that yeah, personally. Sure. I think it's great. Um, and you know, you mentioned about the pandemic and. I would love to know um, how has the pandemic been for both, you know, you three, um, but also just generally for the business. Has it been an opportunity for um, growth and to kind of react to the market, or has it been tough? Like, what has it been like? Oh yeah, no, it's been such a such an year. So I mean, there's some good things happen, bad things happen. It was not all negative, you know, for us. Yeah. So somewhat I'm grateful for some of the you know, I mean, benefits you had we this got. year, for example, new retail partners, which is incredible <laughs> during a pandemic. I mean, that's pretty unheard of. So that's pretty, just, just yeah. to say, amazing. <laughs> yeah, and it was interesting because like, when the pandemic first started, people were stockpiling feminine care products. They were just buying yeah. pads and tampons, like they were buying toilet paper. So we saw a high spike. Um, it was good that some people probably experienced organic feminine care for the first time by doing that mm -hmm. but then there was a dip right after they bought a lot of products you know for a few months so there was a bit of a slow time period but um we were okay because you know we still had a lot of distribution through digital so amazon you know is our number one uh, channel and d2c and you know um during the pandemic when people were staying home they were buying a lot from amazon and then we were essential products so they were still delivering uh pads and tampons so so that was good um, but then the supply chain has become a huge challenge. I'm sure everybody's dealing yeah. with it, you know, and then it's become, it's got even worse this year. So the port issue, you know, the products are not getting released as fast as it should, or uh, the ships coming from Korea, you know, because we bring a lot of products from Korea, we depend on the freight, you know, from Korea, you know, to the US. And there were a lot of delays that were happening. And then because we were also launching in some very major retailers, sometimes we have to air products from Korea to the US to meet the timeline. So, and those you know, numbers not, are scary. I, <laughs> I know. know and, 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 and during a pandemic, it's hiked by three times, four times because oh, no commercial crazy. flights. And, yeah. yeah, lack of containers. Like, can you believe that? And then I lack know. of corrugates, like boxes. It was even difficult to store boxes. <laughs> um, so the supply chain, you know, uh, has become a really big challenge for us over the last few months. And, you know, I just feel like we've been wasting a lot of money on shipping, freight, uh, airing mm. products here and there, unfortunately, to meet uh, the, the timeline for the retail launches. Right. But I'm grateful everybody is healthy. Um, but yeah. um, but I, I do miss my team, you know, because like one of the fun part of this job was to build a team. You know, we started with like five people um, four years ago, and then now we have um, about 35 people in the U.S. and over like 20 people in Korea. So it's a pretty big team, and I enjoy just getting to know everyone and then like see them grow, thrive. You know, it's kind of like a big part of my everyday life. And now I only see, you know, the team heads, like the, you know, Zooms. the executives that I work with, you know, through Zoom, but it's not like I get to talk to all the junior team members on an everyday basis and ask them just mm. like, what did you do yesterday? What did you eat yesterday? Anything like that. So 
I am a little sad about not having those like touches. But you know what? With, you it's going to come. And, and I think uh, hopefully well, when we get to travel more, but also um, it's going to be like, it's a shame because obviously yeah, over that period, there's, you want to enjoy each hire as it comes. But yeah, now you're going to hopefully do a lot of fun team bonding activities. And do you have an office space right now in LA that you have the team all coming to? Yeah, so I'm sitting in our LA office. Uh, we actually have two offices in the US, one in LA, one in Orange County. So we have a few people in Orange County, more on the supply chain management side of things uh, who come out to work, but everybody's working from home. It's been one and a half years. Um, so I'm hoping, I don't know, next spring. Am I ambitious to think that way? I'm hoping that no, next spring. No, I think you're not. <laughs> Let's be ambitious. We need to be ambitious. Be <laughs> yeah, exactly. things will be different. Yeah. Well, no, I, I can, and you're also speaking about supply. I think they should make a documentary on Netflix about the horrors of the pandemic of, of supplier and supply side, because I mean, yeah, I feel you, but you know what? It's part of the learning experience. Everyone's done it and we've got to just push forward and, and focus on the positives, which is you guys are I mean, killing the game. You're increasing um, retail partners and just by doing so you're spreading more of your incredible products to women around the world. And I think that's really important to just sit, take a step back, right? And be like, this is amazing what we've done. It's uh, I, I, very, very different from being in Disney, right? What you're doing yeah. now I mean, in just a short period of time, which is really exciting. Um, but I do, you know, before we go into like some of the fire round questions, I do, I do want to ask you um, kind of your own personal routine and how you stay kind of motivated and grounded in your everyday life. And probably it's shifted a bit with the pandemic because it's often changed a lot of ways of life for people but what do you do every day what's your routine Ooh, do i have a routine um do you have one yeah yeah i mean it's been changing a bit but you know what i am doing more of now is actually a walk <laughs> so i take a walk uh almost every day and that gives me it's kind of like a meditation time for me i would say yeah. um i don't want to be stuck at home all day long and also meditate at home too so what I do more of nowadays is like after dinner, I would just take a walk around my neighborhood. And you know, like um, I'm wearing a mask uh, indoors, but when I take a walk in some of the areas where there are not that many people, I can actually take my mask off and then just get some fresh air too. So that's a part of it as well. Just feeling a bit of like normalness, you know, Normality. while I'm outside. Yeah, I can, sure. I can smell the grass or smell the trees around me. And then, or the uh, pollution just... of LA streets. <laughs> but, some... but still, you'll take it. It's better than the mask. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just like take a walk and there's a park uh, nearby. So I like to see the sunset happening over there. Just uh... kind of see the nature. Because I feel like, Oh, we've been spending too much time indoors, you know, being stuck indoors, at home. on a laptop or a phone and just working, working. Yeah, yeah. and Zoom all day long. So I want to get out, get fresh air, look at the sun, sunset, or like the trees around me. And then uh, that just gives me a lot of kind of comfort um, and then energy when I come back home. And, you know, I wanted to, I've been wanting to do more physical exercises, but, you know, in my gym right now, we all have to wear masks. So oh, I don't know, my... Really? my yeah, my tolerance level is like 30 minutes of working out in my mask. I mean, at least then... it, it, that's good. It's like a hit in training because you're kind of like, you know, people used to, the big athletes used to like actually like take their oxygen level lower by putting those masks on and now you're doing that. So it's kind of good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I, I need that kind of like one hour moment every night yeah. to just kind of, you know, get my stress exactly. out and not mm -hmm. look at emails too, too much and just kind of, you know, walk and look at the nature and the outside and then come back home. It's so, I mean, I, I do think it's a bit of a pandemic thing, but I think it's a lot of this, a lot of this a reason why I asked this question is as a founder, you know, we, we find it, it can be hard to find the balance between, there's always work to do. There's always going to be something. And when you love your job and you love your work and it's your baby, I mean, you don't really feel the need to always take yourself out of it unless you're stressed or had a stressful, stressful moment. So we do end up working a lot. And uh, people probably listening who are not founders probably like okay you're going for walks or i say i'm going to, to the gym and they're like wow and it's like but this is actually something we we, we take for granted because we don't get the chance to do that you know a lot when we're working a lot and yeah. and it's important to recognize that and bring that back into your routine because um the simple things can actually make a big difference to our mental health and and also the productivity to work as mm -hmm. well yeah, um, sure. so i think it's really important um and so now um i do ask this question to everyone um travels opening up and tsa is is kind of 
being a little bit difficult, but they're being okay and they're saying, Yangi, you can take one Rael product with you, but only one. What is your go-to product? Hmm. You know, there's so many that I want to take or need to take, but if I had to choose one, um, I'll choose our serum. So we yeah. have an um, antioxidant serum called uh, Glow Chemistry, and uh, it's a very light texture. So um, with this, I don't have to do a toner, you know, and it gives me a lot of hydration. Um, it's got a novel antioxidant called fluorine, which is, a, which is a lot more potent than vitamin C. So I'll get it from that. And also it's got a lot of hydronic acids, a lot of hydration. I have a very dry skin, so I need a lot of hydration when I'm flying or traveling. So I'll take our serum with me. Uh, I, I will just say a little side note, but um, Yangi was very, very kind to send me a bunch of her incredible products. So yes, it's for women, but also men can enjoy a lot of the products on the site. So <laughs> if you are a man, you can definitely try some out. And I, um, t- the only beauty products I took with me to my recent trip to Portugal was the her um, hydration sheet mask and the vitamin C one. So they were like game changing. And my friend who never uh, kind of ever does anything beauty related or spa related, he actually loved them. So you actually converted someone into sheet masking with the sheet mask. And there awesome. are a lot of sheet masks out there, but yours, yours are phenomenal. I will say that. I really yeah, it's very special. This. Yeah, yeah. It sticks it's, to your skin right away. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It truly does. And it doesn't have the smell. Oh, it's just amazing. And you can tell the quality of the, the, the mask itself. Um, it feels very... Um, for the price, I don't know how you've done it. I don't know how you guys even make money on it, but it just seems, <laughs> it's like this bamboo silky sheet. It's incredible. Yes, yeah. Amazing. So, well, mm-hmm. kudos to that. Um, so fire on questions. These are first things that come to your mind. So the first question I have is, what is another beauty brand that you are currently loving? You know, there are quite a few, but there's something that I use on an everyday basis. Uh, can I name a Korean brand? Absolutely. Yeah, so I don't know if you know them. Uh, they're big in Korea, but not as much here. But there's a beauty, vegan beauty brand called Dear Dahlia. I uh, do know it very well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, they have beautiful retail stores in Korea. So last year when yeah. I went to Korea, I picked up some lipsticks from them, vegan lipsticks. And uh, they're so smooth and I wear them every day because I don't put much makeup anymore, you know. So it's just a lipstick that I put on for Zoom meetings. And I've been loving them, actually, ever since I bought them. Oh, amazing. Mm-hmm. And um, my next question is, uh, what is a guilty pleasure of yours? Um, but you can't say sweets or desserts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my guilty pleasure is definitely uh, Korean dramas. I watch too many of them. And uh, that's how I spend my weekend uh, when I have a lot of time at home just to watch a lot of dramas and just not think much about the work. Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I love horror films as well. So the Korean horror films are my absolute go-to. But oh. have you seen uh, Squid Game? I have read about it. I uh, haven't started yet, but I will. Yeah. I know oh my it's God, like you're a, in for a treat. reason number it, one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's amazing. This is why, um, yeah, I mean, Korea is just the master. At, I mean, obviously everyone's seen Parasite as well, which is incredible. But um, <laughs> next question. What are you currently watching or reading? You know, I'm a bit content consumer than a reader. Um, May sound a little boring, but, uh, you know, I've been consuming or I've been seeing a lot of like documentaries, like historical documentaries to learn Mm. about American history and then also European history. Um, There was like a documentary about 9-11 a few weeks back, uh, Turning Point, because I wanted to learn about it. You know, it was like 9-11 a few weeks ago. And uh, I feel like, I do not understand American history 100 percent, you know, as like, you know, I'm not as knowledge as uh, knowledgeable as other Americans. So I've been watching a lot of historical shows um, and also some dramas mm-hmm. like The Crown. You know, I love I yeah. love learning about British history, too. So yeah. that was also uh, one of my favorites. Oh, great. Um, what's uh, your favorite social media platform right now? I would say still Instagram. I know we, my team has been investing a lot in TikTok these days. I'm trying to yeah. get into it, but I think I'm too old maybe to really learn how to do it all. No, you're, you're, I, you're definitely not, but it is a lot of work and it's a lot of uh, kind of, I guess you could say 
trend hopping, which I don't know if we have the energy and time for in our jobs as CEOs. <laughs> but but uh, I think I'm like you. I'm like, I, I love TikTok for work. My team are on it stay on it but i'm just gonna stick to my instagram for now yeah yeah that's what i'm used to so i'm just sticking with it for the time being Mm -hmm. exactly and last question is if you weren't a beauty entrepreneur but i mean i and and went into film and and (laughs) licensing what would you be doing right now you know uh like Korean drama producer, you know, that mm. kind of stuff. Uh, I yeah. always wanted to be on the creative side of things if I were not pursuing the business side. So that could be something. And uh, I also think a uh, VC world is quite interesting, like investing in startups, you know, so that could be something that I may be able to do in the future. Yeah. Or we should, I'm actually looking into that now. It's something that's my, my next step. Uh, Mm -hmm. but it's going to take some time but we should talk offline about that because I think there is definitely a space I I, I got inspired by many some of my podcast guests who are um, you know, it was so interesting to see how some of them are secret like angel investors or inve- or have their own little funds and then they've also invested in some of the brands on the podcast and I was like this is crazy um, it's actually such a smaller knit world and I'm sometimes thinking about it as like yeah you know I want to support smaller beauty brands so, yeah 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 no I always get inspired by other entrepreneurs especially like the early stage entrepreneur who's so yeah. passionate about what they do what they believe in and even you know at this stage you know when I meet those entrepreneurs I feel like oh yeah I have to go back to that mindset when I first started like four years ago and then you know continue pushing myself so it's very inspirational to see them oh I agree I agree and and we we have a lot to still learn from from them because it's that kind of like I feel the world resets a lot right especially in the beauty industry it's like you're, you're yes you have a knowledge of the last x years or x months but the game's always changing. You've got to be always reinventing and always on your toe. So I think it's important to be getting that kind of young, fresh entrepreneurial spirit injection as yeah. you build a brand because you need yeah, that. Otherwise, sure. it's hard to stay at it. But anyway, I digress. Yangi, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, where can everyone find um, the beautiful Royale brand on socials and the website? And even if you're willing to share your personals, Instagram or social. Yeah, so our website is www.getrial.com. Our handle, Instagram handle is get underscore uh, Rael. Same for TikTok, get underscore Rael. I don't really do social media. I just look at other people's social media. So I don't have any <laughs> for me personally. Perfect. Well, everyone, I'll have all the links hyperlinked in the summary so you can quickly check it out. And I mean, you're very lucky because if you you can obviously check it out and get Royale, but you have incredible retail partners, both physical and online, like Amazon, CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, Target. So you're very fortunate where you can get them and um, do check them out. The packaging is stunning. The products are incredible. Um, I haven't obviously tried the the, the, the feminine hygiene care, but I, I stand, I, I, I trust in the oh, reviews. Oh, you have your sister. You have your sister. I have my um, sister. I yeah. actually messaged her before. I was saying, I'm really excited to speak to Yangi and I've got some of the products that obviously I'm not going to be able to use. So I will send it to her <laughs> and I literally what's her before and she's really excited so thank you yeah, awesome. um, oh, no, thank you so much and um, I hopefully meet very soon in person and continue our conversation and in the meantime I wish you all the success all the happiness and keep on doing what you're doing because it's phenomenal thank you so much Akash I had such a great time today chatting with you and uh, thank you again for having me today